Hello, I am Faye Ellen Silverman. I wish to thank Tanya Leone, whom I have known since she conducted a work of mine on a Brooklyn Philharmonic Family Community Series concert. I would also like to thank Amy Frohley and the entire Composers Now team for giving me this opportunity to offer some thoughts about my music. Composers have very different approaches to the creative process. I would like to share my own approach, starting with my recent work, Healing Hands, a solo flute work created at the request of Douglas Da Silva for a fundraiser for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. When I compose, I start by choosing the instruments and or voices that I wish to use, the approximate length of the work, and if possible, the title. The title often helps generate the materials of the work. When composing Healing Hands, I started by writing the opening of the piece, but often I sketch until I find material that I like, and that material may appear later in the work. I then write and rewrite and rewrite, saving as I go. I start new finale files whenever I want to make changes. Sometimes part of the work is rewritten and sometimes the whole. I know that the work is finished when I stop making changes or when I correct a passage and then feel the need to go back to the original. Creating a coherent structure is important to me. My works tend to create unity by motivic connections. In Healing Hands, the opening three notes are B, C, B, the motif of going away for a short distance and then returning to the original pitch can be heard in many subsequent phrases of this work. It is the building block of much of the music of the piece. The idea of variation as I develop my ideas, noticeable in the way I use the opening pitches, is one way that I unite a work, a technique I learned by studying compositions from past centuries. I love color in clothing, in surroundings, and in music, so tangible possibilities are part of any exploration during the creation of a composition. In Healing Hands, I play on the differences between the higher and the lower registers of the flute, used here to create, as Bach did in his solo violin sonatas, two separate levels. As in other works written for and or dedicated to specific people, I try to personalize the work. Hence this two-level flute idea that will then join into one continuous line came from my image of doctor and patient. The two separate levels represent two separate beings. As with several of my compositions, there is a return to the opening material near the end of the work. Healing Hands uses melody and accessible harmonic language and rhythmic flexibility, all characteristics of my more recent works. While some of my works are volatile and contain more dissonance, this work, in keeping with this title, is a gentle work. Here then is Healing Hands.
Having just played for you one of my shortest works, I would now like to introduce one of my longest ones, my music theater piece called The Free Pen. Although I wrote the work in 1989 and 1990 to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights, I didn't hear it performed until two of my students and one of their colleagues arranged for a concert of this work in 2016, along with a two piano version of my piano concerto written in 1988 called Candlelight, also unperformed until the student organized concert. Thinking of the time and effort invested by my students and their friends in this complex concert still touches me deeply. A free pen is about freedom of speech, one of my core beliefs. The libretto, which I compiled from historic and literary documents on Socrates, Spinoza, Zenger, and others, deals with the struggles to speak and write honestly without risk of punishment, starting from ancient Greece and China and continuing today in many parts of the world. Texts were chosen to span various cultures, religions, and historic periods in order to emphasize the universality of the theme. The work in six scenes prefaced by an introduction is performed without a break. The first scene deals with the excommunication of Baruch Spinoza, a Dutch philosopher whose writings laid the foundations for the enlightenment and modern biblical criticism. The text of his excommunication starts with cursed be he. For this presentation, due to time limitations, I will begin by showing the second scene. It restates parts of the excommunication of Spinoza, sung again by the soprano soloists, alternating with the narrator, who describes other examples of repressed thoughts and speech through various civilizations and various historical times. Each of these is accompanied by music suggesting its time, including the Battle Hymn of the Republic and music with Arabic inflections. Here then is scene two from A Free Pen. except for works on agriculture, medicine, pharmacy, and divination. Council in Reims accused the scholastic philosopher Rosalind, teacher of Abelard, of heresy, and he recanted for fear of being stoned to death. Thank you. 
sets a speech of Socrates after he is condemned to death, accompanied by a harp to suggest a Greek lyre, followed by a very upbeat melody as parts of the instrumental ensemble ignore the issue and continue blithely. Scene four is the trial of John Peter Zenger in 1735. Zenger was a German-American printer and journalist in New York City charged with printing libel. This case established the precedent in the American colonies for freedom of the press. Scene five takes the form of a political rally. While the protesters, the chorus, advocate for free speech, Socrates, John Alexander, the lawyer of the Zenger trial, and the narrator quote the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Meanwhile, the soprano, joined now by the alto, who had sung the legal charges against Zenger in the previous scene, restates part of the Spinoza excommunication text. The female soloists in the crowd drown out the Bill of Rights. Part of the chorus now shifts sentiments and shouts, ban him, which is part of the anti-Spinoza text, and then advocates violence against those demanding free speech now. The final scene quotes John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, ending with the passage which states, these are exactly the occasions on which the men of one generation commit those dreadful mistakes which excite the astonishment and horror of posterity. Then the chorus and the soloists join to quote Euripides once again, a quote first heard in scene one. The words are, who can give judgment? Who can grasp arguments? Ere from both sides, he clearly learned their pleas. The work ends with this plea for tolerance in troubled times, sung to consonant music and expressing hope that the imprisonment of those expressing unpopular thought will cease and that civility will prevail. I will now show you the last two scenes of a free pen, scenes five and six. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Free speech, free speech, free speech, free speech. No, 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 no. Free speech, free speech, free speech, free speech. Free speech. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Free speech now! Free speech now! Free speech now! Free speech now! Free speech! Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise.
exercise thereof. Or enriching the freedom, the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. essay on liberty. I must be permitted to observe that it is not the feeling sure of a doctrine, be it what it may, which I call an assumption of infallibility. undertaking to decide that question for authors without allowing them to hear what can be said on the contrary side. However positive anyone's persuasion may be,
which the men of one generation commit those dreadful mistakes. <laughs> which excite astonishment. And horror. Of posterity. Very often I am asked to write a work for a combination of performers that I wouldn't have otherwise considered. This past spring, for example, I created a short work on Mark Twain's quotes for soprano, tenor, trumpet, and piano for a June Concert of Composers Concordance. I am closing this presentation with an earlier example of a request that led me to write what became one of my favorite compositions. When Gilda Lyons, whom I met at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, otherwise known as VCCA, commissioned this work for Seraphim, she mentioned that the group, which consisted of soprano, mezzo-soprano, and cello, would like a work without words for the Phoenix concert series. I had never considered writing a vocal work not based on text, but this suggestion, I discovered, freed my imagination. This resulted in Manhattan Fixation, composed in 2007. I will leave you then with the last movement of this work, written as a lullaby for Gilda's new child, yet unborn at the time of this composition, but anticipated with excitement and love. Thank you so much for allowing me to share this time with you.